France fell on June 20th of 1940, World War II had not really begun. I know that we often say that the war began in September when Germany invaded Poland, but the two major powers that would turn these European wars into a global conflict, the Soviet Union and the United States, had not ended the war. In other words, from 1939 to the fall of France had been a series of European border wars. Norway, Poland, Denmark, Belgium, Holland, France. And in every single one of them, except one, Germany had been successful. Italy had piled on. Italy had been successful in Abyssinia. It had troops in Libya. For all practical purposes, the war was over with. The Western European powers had lost. Those in Eastern Europe who had not joined Germany, the Hungarians, the Romanians, were going to be defeated, as in the case of the Poles. Britain alone stood by itself, and it did stand by itself. The United States was not willing to enter to help Britain during the Blitz. The Blitz had not worked, but on the other hand, Britain had no power to conduct offensive operations against the Third Reich. So what happened? Did Hitler end the war? He tried to make entreaties to Churchill, and he said, let's just, I went down to the poker table, I got my winnings, I want to get up now and leave. And Churchill, by sheer force of will, said no. Hitler went to his generals and said, how can we force Britain out of the war? The United States is not helping them. Russia is not helping them. Why do they still want to fight? And he got the answer that he could do it by submarines, but not by the Luftwaffe, and maybe not even by U-boats. So he concocted a crazy scheme, in some sense, to attack his partner, the Soviet Union, defeat the Soviet Union, and gain so many assets and so much prestige that then Britain would not stand by itself against all of Europe and the Soviet Union. And so we mark really the beginning of World War II in the fullest sense with the entry of two powers, the Soviet Union and the United States in 1940. It's not that this year there wasn't any conflict. Hitler picked up victories in Crete and against the Yugoslavians, but basically it was a year of peace where he would try to consolidate his winnings and he tried to get rid of Britain any way he could. And when he couldn't, he came up with a counterintuitive idea of attacking somebody like the Soviet Union who was giving him all these supplies. Now he did that because he thought he could get away with it. Stalin had liquidated 30,000 plus of his officers in the late 1930s. He had fared very poorly against Poland. He hadn't done well uh, in Finland. And in Hitler's way of thinking, you just kick down the rotten door and the whole thing collapses. And so he, on June 22nd, 1941, he invaded his partner, the Soviet Union, and that really began the global conflagration. It was based on some strange reasoning that he could use Blitzkrieg, as he had done so effectively in Denmark and Poland and France, against a country of two to 3,000 miles in length. And he could do this in three or four weeks on the idea that Russia had been knocked out earlier than France in World War I, and France had been knocked out very quickly in World War II, so it would be the same calculus. And so we organized the largest invasion force in the history of conflict even today. In the last 2,500 years, there was never an invading army as large as Hitler's, which was somewhere around three and a half million Axis troops, and maybe even a little bit larger if we count in the Hungarians, the Romanians. And in a complete surprise attack, in a three-pronged attack, the morning of the 22nd of June, Hitler raced into the Soviet Union. In the first 30 days, von Lieb's forces drove to within 125 miles of Leningrad, while the Finns under Mannerheim, supported by the Germans, began a drive from the north to encircle the city. In the center, von Bock's army plunged 480 miles into Soviet territory. Within two weeks, he had essentially destroyed the Soviet Air Force, such as it was. He had essentially destroyed 60% of Soviet armor, and he had captured or destroyed 2 million soldiers. And it was a brilliant plan, ostensibly, in a superficial sense, because it incorporated national resentments in Eastern Europe. Army Group North, led by General Lieb, raced through the Baltic states, 
Lithuania, Latvia, and Estonia, and they were greeted as liberators, people who had just despised the Soviet Union's prior a year and a half of rule, and they put, the idea was they were going to just get right through the Baltic states, they were going to get help from all of these peoples, and the Finns were waiting on the other side of Leningrad, the former St. Petersburg, and with Army Group North, 600,000 troops, they were going to make a ring around St. Petersburg, and Hitler said, I want to destroy this rotten city, second largest Soviet city, 10% of all munitions made in Russia. They were going to get it destroyed by September, and then in a grand arc, Army Group North was going to come to the rear of Moscow and meet up with General Bach's Army Group Center, a million and a half men going straight toward Moscow. And while these two were knocking off the two twin pillars of Russian society, St. Petersburg and Moscow, Army Group South was going to be the strategic arm. It was going to go after the muscles that ran the Soviet Union. It was going to go through the Ukraine, capture the great grain belts of the Soviet Union, go into the Crimea, cut them off on the Black Sea, and go to the Don and Volga rivers and end up in the Caucasus Mountains with 90% of the Soviet's oil. It almost pulled it off. And in the months of August and September, Hitler made a catastrophic blunder. He was so worried that the capture of Moscow might turn Napoleonic. That is, Napoleon had taken Moscow, but he hadn't taken Russia. So he didn't think it was an iconic city, which it was, and he didn't think it was strategically as significant as destroying the Red Army. So he diverted at least a third of Army Group Center's strength, and they met with Army Group South and the Great Kiev Pocket, largest capitulation in history of conflict, 660,000 prisoners surrendered. And with the other pockets that had been Army Group North and earlier in June, there were now three to four million Soviet prisoners. The problem was that he lost six weeks and he put a lot of wear and tear on the panzers. And so when the final time came to push back toward Moscow and bring back panzers from Army Group North that he had lent out and back from Army Group South, we were in late summer. And he was going to use this great Operation Typhoon force, and he would get to the first subway station in Moscow on December 8th and 9th, and there he would stop. And the same thing would be true of Army Group South. It would stop before it got to Sebastopol, and Army Group North would stop at Leningrad and be there for the next 900, 900 day siege. What happened? The fact is that Blitzkrieg was never designed uh, as brilliant as it was with its fast moving armor, its close support from Stuka dive bombers, its 88 millimeter artillery support. It was never designed for a long, drawn out, logistically complex war that would require months and months of planning. Hitler believed that the Russians at Leningrad, at St. Petersburg, or in the Crimea would just simply fold in the way that the Parisians had, or the citizens of Rotterdam had, or the people in Warsaw. Never in his right mind did he think that they would fight to the last man and delay him and wait for winter and wait for the great Soviet factories that had been transported on the other side of the Urals to come into production. So as we leave uh, 1941, what happened to Operation Barbarossa? It's static. It's stalled. It's stalled in front of the great cities of Soviet Union. It hasn't lost, but it hasn't won. At the same time this is happening, right as Army Group Center is ready to get closer and closer to Moscow and maybe take it, the Japanese declare war in the United States and bomb us at Pearl Harbor and attack us, destroying half our air fleet in the Philippines. And they attack Singapore. They sink a big battle cruiser. And suddenly, in the Pacific, there's only three carriers and one battleship left to the Allies. And the Japanese do in the Pacific between December of 1941 and the Battle of Midway in June of 1942, precisely what Hitler did in Europe in 1939 and 40. They run wild. And the Philippines falls, Wake Island falls, Singapore falls, Burma falls, the Dutch East India, modern Indonesia falls and all of the orphan colonies from the now defunct and non-existent European powers, Belgium, France, come into the possession of the Japanese. Now, what's the logic behind all of this? Because why in the world would the Japanese and the Axis powers, Italy and Germany, do the two things that can lose them the war? Because if you don't have the United States in the war and you don't have Russia in the war against you, you can win because you just have to defeat Britain. And their way of thinking, of course, they didn't think the United States would fight, and if they did fight, they wouldn't fight well, because they were very dissatisfied with the 
outcome of World War I. They had let Britain be bombed without repercussions. They hadn't intervened. Russia had made a deal with them. And so in their way of thinking, we had such a head start in World War II, because we've been arming since the 30s, there is no way in the world that they're going to catch up to us. So we're going to run a blitzkrieg in Europe, another blitzkrieg in the Soviet Union, a blitzkrieg in the Mediterranean with Mussolini, a blitzkrieg in the Pacific, and then our enemies will be so shocked, so awed, that they'll just come to the table and say, let's quit. Never in their right mind did they think or nor were they equipped to fight something that we want to call World War II. At this point, we're now into World War II. The conflict will go all the way around the circumference of the world, and there's U-boats waiting off the East Coast. What are the strategies at this point to defeat the Axis or, and the other, vice versa, to defeat the Allies? Hitler is thinking, I have to get rid of Britain, and now I have to get rid of the United States, and I have to get rid of the Soviet Union. I cannot take Moscow and Leningrad. The winter came too soon. So next year, I have a plan to cut off all the strategic materials to the Soviet Union by blocking the Don and Volga rivers, taking control of the Caspian and Black Seas, and stopping their access to oil. With the capture of Stalingrad, the Nazis would have a base from which to launch a flanking attack on Moscow. With one master stroke, the Russian armies to the south would be cut off from help. And in the north, Russian factories, Russian farms, and Russian armies would be practically cut off from Caucasus oil. German control of the entrance to the Volga and its two main ports, Astrakhan and Stalingrad, would be a crippling blow for Russia. As far as the United States is concerned, they, not me, have a two-front war now. I declared war with them after I heard they were attacked at Pearl Harbor. I didn't even know where Pearl Harbor was. But after they're attacked at Pearl Harbor, they have their fleet in the Pacific, and they don't have access or naval superiority to get through the Atlantic through my U-boat fleet and to conduct serious operations against me. They're stuck. And Britain, Britain is going to be starved out by a U-boat campaign. If the Blitz didn't quite do it, the U-boats will. Well, so as German armies are at the periphery, almost ready to take Russia, but not quite, as their supplies run out and winter gets um, into full blast, by early 1942, the Germans have stepped up the U-boat campaign. And they now have six to 700 U-boats that are trying to encircle uh, Britain and to stop their lifelines from Canada and the United States. And they have an advantage because with the fall of France, these U-boats are leaving from fortified pins along the French coast. They're not trapped in the Baltic Sea. And more importantly, they're sitting off the coast of New Jersey to Florida, ready to pick off American convoys. And for most of 1942, the happy time, they're able to cut 50% of British incoming imports of food and vital materials. At the same time this is going on, the Germans are very confident, as are the Japanese, that they're pretty much immune from Allied air power. With the absorption of all the European continent, the only place you can attack occupied Europe or Germany itself is from the Great Britain. But to get in Great Britain, you have to fly not only over the channel, but the moment you get over French airspace, there's a sequence of Luftwaffe airfields waiting to send very sophisticated pilots up in ME-109s and later Focke-Wulf 190s and to trail you all the way into Germany and back. So even though the Americans are now in the war and they're trying to send over their vaunted B-17, and by late 1942, they're running daylight precision missions over Germany, it's a complete failure. Once in a while, they get lucky at the fire raid of Cologne in uh, spring of 1942, but 1942 is a disaster for the Americans and the British in terms of strategic bombing. And we do not have a strategic bomber like the B-29 with a range of 1,600 miles, and we don't have B-24s with bases close enough to attack Japan. So as we go on to 1942, what seemed ludicrous, Japan attacking the Industrial Colossus, Germany attacking the Soviet Union and the United States, it doesn't look so crazy. Almost everywhere you look in the world, it's Axis controlled. Most of industrial China is Axis. All of the Pacific is Axis. Only North America and South America are free, and South America is basically neutral. Europe is occupied, or in terms of the Iberian Peninsula in Switzerland or Turkey, it's pro-Axis. Most of the Mediterranean is an Axis lake. So Hitler's gamble and the Japanese militarist gamble seems to pay off. 
And then something starts to happen as 1942 closes. In a series of dramatic battles, the Allies prove to the Axis powers that they're not going to negotiate. And although they were surprised and although they're underprepared and they're ill-equipped, they still believe if they can just hold on, the huge industrial potential of the United States and Britain will still save them. And in North Africa, Rommel, who has been running wild since February of 1942, takes to Brook in June of 1942. It's the worst, second worst surrender in the history of the British military. Only Singapore in February, a few months earlier, is, is even more devastating. And when Tobruk falls, Stalingrad seems to be next, and then something crazy happens. The British rebound. Uh, the British fleet coming out of Suez and Gibraltar is able to stop convoys that are supplying Rommel and the African Corps. And Montgomery holds a line September, October at El Alamein, 90 miles from Alexandria. And that's the furthest point that the Germans will ever get in North Africa. Montgomery had said, give me a fortnight and I can resist the German attack. Give me three weeks and I can defeat the Boch. Give me a month and I will chase him out of Africa. Thus, he instilled in his troops his own supreme confidence. The second key point is at Stalingrad in September, the Germans enter the city, they control 90% of it, they cut off all traffic on the Volga. They have two groups, they've split in the second year of the war, they have this enormous army group south. It's got over just about 1.2 million men in it. And they're holding at Leningrad, they're holding at Moscow, but something unheard of happens. The Russians pour men into Stalingrad as sacrificial pawns. They fight among the rubble. The winter is on them as it was in Moscow. It's general winter, the Soviets call it. And suddenly the Marshal Zhukov looks at the two flanks, 30 miles behind General Paulus' 6th Army, and he says, they're Romanians and Italians. They don't want to be there. We're going to attack them and an enormous Operation Uranus, it's called. He destroys the Italian and the Romanian armies, and he completes a loop in November around the 6th Army. 300,000 of the best soldiers in the world are now trapped in Stalingrad. And that means that even though the Volga River is cut off, the other half of Army Group South has to do something, because if Stalingrad falls, there's a Russian army to their rear. They send General Manstein back, and Hitler says, you've got to save my army. He says, I don't really think I can. Hermann Goring says, I can supply them by air. He can't. And the result of it is November, December, January, February, this great army contracts. It's starved. It gets typhus. It runs out of ammunition. It cannot be relieved. Hitler does not allow it to break out. And when it's all said, there's the, the complete destruction of the 6th and 4th Panzer armies. 150,000 killed. 50,000 missing, 100,000 surrendered to the Russians, and the greatest disaster in German military history. So this comes on the heels of El Alamein's checking Axis power, Italian and German, in North Africa. And now as the new year of 1943 breaks out, they surrender. The Germans do at Stalingrad, and they never go beyond the Caucasus Mountains. Everything from now on will be a retreat, more or less back from the original lines of December 1941. There's another ray of good news for the Allies. The Japanese, after this enormously successful naval blitzkrieg, has decided to take a little obscure island in the Gilbert chain called Guadalcanal. And if you take Guadalcanal, you simply cannot send a convoy from Canada to the United States to supply Australia. And a funny thing happens. The Americans decide to contest it. In late 1942, November, December, all the way to February, the United States not only contests Guadalcanal, but the 1st Marine Division shows itself to be far more fierce, even more savage. The U.S. Navy takes horrific losses in the Santa Cruz Island, but basically stops the Japanese supply. And this is coming on the heels of the incredible victory at Midway in June. And the same thing that's happened to the Italians and the Germans is now happening to the Japanese. The war is starting to stall. In other words, it's not true that the German idea of a Volk or the Japanese idea of a Yamato or the Italian idea of Raza that racially we are such better people, we're such better at fighting that one of our Italian or one of our German or one of our Japanese soldiers is worth one of you decadent Americans or you Bolsheviks. 
just simply didn't happen. That at places like El Alamein and Stalingrad at Guadalcanal, the Allies who were outmanned and outsupplied fought better than their Axis counterparts. The second thing was happening as 1943 ran, ran on. The whole Axis strategy of winning very quickly with a head start, consolidating your winnings, and then negotiating was now proved to be bankrupt. And the Allies started to gain confidence, and they said, this is now going to be a war of attrition. The fundamental question of World War II, remember, was this. Hitler invaded the Soviet Union, and the Japanese Yamato and Tojo invaded the Pacific Rim because they did not think that ultimately they would have fewer people or manpower or industrial output. They said to themselves, Europe from the Atlantic coast all the way to the border of Russia, from the Arctic Circle to the tip of Italy, has more people and greater industry than the Soviet Union does. We control it all. And if you look at from the Aleutians to Burma, and from Wake Island all the way to Manchuria, we have more rubber, we have more oil, we have more natural gas, we got everything we need. So in the Axis mine, it was just simply a question of reorganizing all of these vast new conquered territories, and then they would have as much natural advantage and potential as would the Allies. What they never figured on was that their very racial categories would offend indigenous peoples. So think of it for a minute. If you're a continental European, a Dutchman, or you're a Frenchman, you would rather help Britain, an island, than a fellow continental German. Now, just because Japan is a supposedly fellow Asian nation does not mean you would not prefer to work with the British and the Americans. So the second Axis calculation, not only were they going to win quickly and then negotiate, but even if they couldn't, they would get so much territory and manpower they had greater long-term potential was proved to be bogus. From now on, there was going to be a war of attrition, the third strategy. Can we make victory so difficult for the Allies? Can we make it so hard to go into downtown Rome, downtown Berlin, downtown Tokyo, that they will negotiate? And in that negotiation, will they let us have most of Europe, most of the Mediterranean, most of the Pacific. Because it's one thing to defeat a power, and it's another thing to occupy it, humiliate it, and destroy their ideology. We're not asking that. We don't want to go into Washington. We don't want to go anymore to go into Moscow, even. We don't even want to go into London. But you people want to go into our capital cities and destroy us, and that's going to cost you so much you'd rather quit. And so the attitude is, uh, from now on, the Allies know that they have to bomb Germany but bomb it to such a degree that people will give up on German ideology. And the Germans are saying, they may be able to bomb us, but they're going to take such a toll in pilots, eventually 30,000 crews, American, 30,000 Brits, that it won't be worth it. So they're saying to the Russians, do you really want to lose 20 million people to get into Berlin? And so we have a real problem of trying to find in 1943 and as early 1944 as to how to defeat these fascist powers in such a way that it doesn't destroy so many people that our own publics don't think it's worth it. As 1943 ends in optimism that we've made these enormous turnarounds, in North Africa, at Stalingrad. The second phase becomes very difficult, and the Russian army doesn't do well after Stalingrad. They go another 100 miles and pushing the Germans back, but they say to us, when is the second front going to come? We've lost millions of people, and I know Ger Germany's running out of resources, but so are we. And we're saying to them, we're not capable of landing on the Normandy coast and going all the way to Berlin yet. We've got to go to North Africa first and fight the Italians and the Germans who are trapped, and we do, and they, they will surrender in, in June of 1943. 250,000 will surrender. Then we've got to go to Sicily. Then we've got to be incremental and go to Italy. Because what we are trying to do, the Americans and the British, we're trying to open some type of second front. And as that starts to happen in 1943, as we range deeper and deeper into Germany, and Germany has to send more and more troops to Italy, to North Africa, to Sicily, to fight B-17s, to fight Lancasters, the Soviet Union starts to get better and better and better. Its industries pick up more lend lease, and you can see this critical tipping point start to change. And the same thing with Japan. In 1943, we get together and we say, okay, we can stop the Japanese, we stop the Guadalcanal, we stop, we've taken an island tar. We've got to come up with a strategy how to get to downtown Tokyo. And there's a big debate. General MacArthur has one idea, General Nimitz has another. 
as 1943 closes, it's a, simply a question, how quickly can the Allies get into Germany and get in Japan and knock Italy out of the war before their publics find out that the cost is not worth unconditional surrender and they'd rather just negotiate an armistice.